Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 215th session of the online Optom Learning Series OLS. And uh, for today's session, we have with us Dr. Erin Roof. Dr. Erin received her Doctor of Optometry degree from the Ohio State University. And upon graduation, she has also completed the Cornea and Contact Lens Advanced Practice Fellowship. And then she continued to be a clinical instructor as well as did her PhD in vision science where she studied a little bit about uh, the research focus was about identifying vision related causes of contact lens discomfort. Uh, currently, she's an associate professor and the chief of the cornea and contact lens services at the Southern College of Optometry in California. Uh, she is teaching as well. Uh, she likes to teach about contact lenses and cornea, and her practice also includes special interests in multifocal lenses, gas permeables, sclerals, uh, fitting patients with dry eye, as well as keratoconus. Uh, she is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, and I would say uh, she is also a very recent diplomat of the cornea, contact lens, and refractive technology section of the Academy, and I was fortunate to attend uh, where she was being felicitated uh, for her diploma. So, welcome, uh, Dr. Aaron, uh, onto the platform, and let me, you know, leave the screen time to you, please. Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Yes, we went. We were in the trenches in the diploma process. So, <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining me for the talk today. Um, I'm coming to you from Southern California and it is very early here. So forgive me if I still have my like morning voice, but we're gonna make it work this morning. So I'm gonna talk to you about a topic that as my, as the introduction you just heard might suggest, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, how vision can influence um, contact lens discomfort in our contact lens wearers. So that might seem like a new or novel or strange concept to you, depending on how much you've thought about this type of concept. And so I'm going to talk to you today about um, some of the evidence that suggests that vision can influence comfort and most importantly, how you can consider vision and vision related issues when you're managing contact lens discomfort um, with your patients. So let's define contact lens discomfort first. Contact lens discomfort is arguably the most frustrating clinical condition to manage because there are so many potential causes and it's somewhat subjective. So when I'm encountering a complex, confusing, frustrating condition, I kind of like to go to the back to basics or to the foundation and, you know, really define what the condition is that I'm up against. And luckily for us, uh, about 10 years ago now, uh, the Tearfoam and Ocular Surface Society, sort of a group of experts on all things ocular surface and contact lenses came together to sort of do a workshop on contact lens discomfort to better define it so that we can better understand it and better manage it. And this is how they defined contact lens discomfort. I'm not going to read this word for word for you, but um, basically they said that discomfort is characterized by episodic or persistent ocular sensations. It might occur with or without visual disturbance. Um, it's going to re result in a reduced compatibility between the lens and the ocular environment. And most frustratingly, contact lens discomfort is going to lead to decreased or discontinued contact lens wear, which if you're fitting contact lenses, that's the last thing you want, right? We don't want our patients to discontinue their contact lens wear. And even more frustratingly, their general conclusion about contact lens discomfort after they sort of did a deep dive into the literature and, and tried to come up with, you know, a, a why and a, a why for why this was occurring and how we can best manage it. Their conclusion was Given the current state of knowledge surrounding the condition, a proportion of patients will remain with re residual levels of discomfort that are so bothersome that they're going to discontinue wear. Again, a really frustrating conclusion. This huge effort to really define and better understand the condition only left us with sort of more questions. Um, and so let me, let's summarize, let's summarize what that current state of knowledge is about contact lens discomfort and why can seem so frustrating and confounding. So first let's talk about epidemiology. When we talk about contact lens discomfort, a lot of times when a patient says they're uncomfortable, the first thing you think about is 
the ocular surface. Sometimes a patient will use synonymously the words uncom- discomfort and dryness, or they may not even say they're uncomfortable. They might just say their eyes feel dry or irritated when they're wearing the contact lenses. So it's easy for us to assume that contact lens discomfort is always related to an incompatibility between the lens and the ocular surface or a dry eye issue. But really interestingly, symptoms and signs of discomfort really don't align or correlate well with symptoms and signs of dry eye. Um, So for instance, while symptoms of discomfort are typically very similar to symptoms of general dry eye, Discomfort epidemiology does not tend to follow the same epidemiological trends that we see in dry eye patients. Um, Contact lens discomfort does not seem to be associated with gender or age, like we see with patients with dry eye. We tend to see um, dry eye patients tend to have um, uh, to occur more in females and tend to increase with age. We don't see that with contact lens discomfort. In fact, there's been some good reports that have suggested that discomfort actually decreases with age. As well, symptom severity in our uncomfortable contact lens wearers does not correlate with severity of dry dry eye signs. Um, signs that typically indicate dry eye just don't show up in our patients that are um, complaining of contact lens discomfort. This study I cite on the second bullet here by Young et al. is a really compelling study. They did, uh, I think, 10 or more different dry eye tests in a group of patients that were had significant contact lens discomfort and found that in a quarter of them, not a single dry eye test came back even moderately significant, meaning you know, (laughs) there's a chance if you do that many tests that somebody's going to come back with a sort of Uh, false positive, but I think it's pretty compelling that in a group of very uncomfortable wearers, a quarter of them have basically pristine ocular surfaces. It's also just important to note that the general symptomology of contact lens discomfort, while it's similar in some ways to general dry eye, it is distinct and separate in other ways. And some of those ways are that our uncomfortable contact lens wearers are going to have symptoms that become more intense and frequent either at the end of the day or with uh, more contact lens wear. And importantly, their symptoms are going to improve with lens removal. Um, So that that fact in and of itself suggests that the contact lens itself is inducing these symptoms. um, And when it's removed, the symptoms improve. Despite the fact that, you know, our clinical evidence doesn't show that uncomfortable lens wearers have a significant sort of ocular surface incompatibility between the lens and the surface. Most of the treatments we choose when we're trying to combat contact lens discomfort are targeted at dryness or ocular surface issues. So you can see here this study sort of citing the most common ways that we as eye care providers manage contact lens discomfort. And it almost always results in something like trying a new lens, adding a new lubricant, changing up solution, increasing ref- replacement frequency, doing things that are optimizing the the compatibility between the lens and the surface, despite very little evidence that there is an incompatibility between the lens and the surface. This is sort of a flowchart that the TFOS uh, devised as they were um, kind of coming up with their, um, as they were kind of expanding our understanding of contact lens discomfort. And I know the words are small here. It's not really important that you see each individual, what each individual box is saying, but this is sort of their uh, the flow chart or treatment algorithm for contact lens discomfort. And again, with without even reading any of the words, just looking at the general structure of this, it's confusing, right? Like this, I think, describes what our the inside of our brains look like when we're trying to figure out why our patients are so uncomfortable. Um, I think if you have to use emojis to and uh, to infer if your treatment or plan is good or bad, that's not great, right? Like that means that, you know, this is a complex condition and we need to maybe consider other things that could be contributing to it. Unfortunately, the most common form of self-treatment by a patient when they experience discomfort is lens removal. Um, About 30% of contact lens wearers will discontinue lens wear at some point in their life. And it's been reported that up to a quarter of contact lens wearers will discontinue lens wear permanently. That is super frustrating um, to think that a quarter of all the patients I fit, I was in clinic yesterday, a quarter of all those patients are going to drop out of lens wear. It's like, what what were we even doing, right? Right? Why did we even waste our time? So 
with all of that frustrating information that I just presented to you, um, we have to kind of stop and ask ourselves when we're considering contact lens discomfort, if, if we keep aligning discomfort with dry eye, we keep assuming that discomfort is directly related to dry eye, we're going to keep running into these same problems. So if the signs of ocular surface disease don't match our, um, the symptom severity in our, um, uncomfortable contact lens wearers, if the epidemiology doesn't make sense. And importantly, if our treatment strategies aren't working, we have to stop and consider if contact lens discomfort is being influenced by something other than dry eye. And obviously, I'm going to tell you that I <laughs> think it is if you heard anything at, uh, at the beginning of this lecture. Um, vision can play a really important role in comfort um, with contact lens wear or just generally in our eyes. And I think I know that vision is a really overlooked cause of discomfort in our contact lens wearers. And I'll tell you, you know, I've been working on this concept for over a decade now. And when I first started talking to people about how vision influences comfort in our contact lens wearers, I got a lot of, you know, uh, judgy looks and people not really understanding where I was coming from. But I've been um, encouraged, especially in the last uh, several years, that a lot of other um, uh, clinicians and researchers have started to um, kind of better understand this concept and investigate this as well, that vision can influence comfort in our contact lens wearers. I'm going to cite a lot of research that I've done as we move through this lecture, but as we get started here, I was um, this uh, trial that came out in 2020 um, was interesting to me. Uh, this is a trial that evaluated comfort in a group of um, contact lens wearers that wore various different soft toric lenses. And they found that the patients reported better uh, comfort when their subjective vision was better. Um, so not their objective vision. So visual acuity is sort of what we as you know clinicians consider um, objective vision. But importantly for this study, when the patients had a subjective, you know, their just general opinion and preference of their vision was better, they reported better comfort. Um, and these researchers concluded that symptoms of ocular discomfort might be more intense if there's also a perceived visual compromise in our patients. And I remember reading this paper and thinking, yes, yes, that's what I've been trying to say. Um, and so, so, um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more moving forward, a lot more moving forward. So, you know, we're all eye care providers. We all provide eye care in some way. And vision is a big part of how we um, provide full scope care to our patients. So why has vision been such an overlooked cause of discomfort in our contact lens wearers? Well, I'd argue it's because we don't even consider vision when we think about contact lens discomfort. It's like we put our vision side of the brain, turn it off when our patients start complaining of discomfort and only start thinking about that ocular surface. And we can see this just when we look at uh, research studies that look at contact lens discomfort. In studies that evaluate discomfort, it's very rare for a study to even measure visual acuity, let alone ask a patient about their subjective visual experience. Uh, most discomfort studies look at just symptoms and ocular surface signs um, and Acuity, again, is just not a, a clinical measure that's commonly used in a dry eye or a contact lens discomfort study. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about binocular vision testing moving forward, but that's definitely not a part of a standard dry eye or discomfort protocol. So if we're not considering it, measuring it, asking about it, or looking at it, we're not going to find those associations that might be there. When our patients tell us they're uncomfortable, we don't ask them about our vision. And as healthcare providers that are responsible for providing the very best vision, we're doing our patients a service by not considering vision when they complain about contact lens discomfort. Interestingly, if we ask our patients about vision when they're complaining of uncomfortable contact lens wear, they're going to tell us that vision is an important factor in their overall comfort experience. Um, so a lot of studies that have um, looked at reasons for contact lens dis discontinuation will ask patients, you know, hey, why did you drop out of contact lens wear? Most of the like sort of historical discontinuation studies rarely ask about vision as a primary motivator for discontinuing contact lens wear. Um, so I did a, a study where we did that. So we asked a group of patients that are 
notorious for dropping out of contact lens wear, presbyopes, why they stopped wearing their contact lenses. And while discomfort has always been cited as the number one reason for contact lens dropout, we also gave them an option to report vision as a primary reason for discontinuing contact lens wear. And you can see here that discomfort and vision were essentially reported the, the same. They were sort of neck and neck for the top reason for discontinuing contact lens wear. And that's really important to note here that typically presbyopes, which as we know, have very unique vision and comfort needs and demands are difficult to satisfy in contact lens wear. And so it's important to note here that our presbyopes, this, again, this group that is very um, known for dropping out of contact lens wear, will report vision as much as a motivator as discomfort for dropping out of contact lens wear. Even more, in the same group, we found that people who had dropped out of contact lens wear had worse overall opinion of their vision at all distances, near, intermediate, distance, no matter where they were looking, if they had dropped out of contact lens wear, they had a worse opinion of their vision than those patients who were still in contact lenses. That really harkens back to that other study that I just mentioned that said that um, subjective uh, opinion of vision really influenced comfort scores. So this became really interesting to me and we started doing lots of um, studies looking at contact lens discomfort and I wanted to make sure that when I was recruiting people who were uncomfortable in contact lens wear that their comfort was not caused by a visual issue. And so um, in this particular clinical trial that we were recruiting patients, we wanted to make sure they had sort of pure contact lens discomfort that wasn't caused by existing dry eye or an existing visual issue. The lenses we were using in this study were um, single vision um, or single vision or multifocal um, spherical lenses. So we also had to exclude anyone who had significant astigmatism because we didn't have a lens power for those patients. So just bear with me here to join me on this journey. I'm trying to explain a, an interesting sort of uh, clinical finding we found that, that indicated that patients might be experiencing visual discomfort. So we recruited a group of patients that, again, reported significant discomfort. We gave them a survey. They had to get a certain discomfort score on a survey. We invited them in. <clears throat> These patients all had confirmed that they were wearing a spherical contact lens. We also asked that they were, um, we were recruiting patients only that were myopic, again, just because of the powers of the lenses we were using for the study. So we had to do some initial testing to make sure that they fit in all of the inclusion criteria. We also didn't want these patients to have any significant signs of binocular vision disorders because previous work we had done, which I'll talk about a little later, had indicated that that, that could be an issue in these patients. So again, all of these patients were uncomfortable. They had significantly high scores on the CLDEQ, which is a contact lens discomfort survey. I think most people would assume that, you know, considering all of these um, uh, criteria that a patient could maybe not qualify once they get in the study that probably dry eye would be the most common reason why people weren't um, qualifying. But in this group of really uncomfortable contact lens wearers, we had um, many people not qualify for the study based on mostly visual issues, actually. So while dry eye was reported as a reason for um, not qualifying in about 15, about 17 percent of the patients, uh, most patients didn't qualify because they actually had signs of convergence insufficiency. So um, about 35% of the patients who didn't qualify had uh, a high exophoria at near and they're reporting discomfort with their contact lenses, but they also can't converge when they're reading. About 25% who didn't qualify actually had a, lo a lot of astigmatism in their refractive error, but they were wearing spherical contact lenses. So they might have had a diopter, a diopter and a half of astigmatism, but when they put on contact lenses, they were wearing a spherical correction. And this made me wonder if maybe some of their discomfort while wearing contact lenses was more associated with eye strain associated with their poorly corrected refractive error. Also, um, about 17% of patients in this study didn't qualify because they had what we labeled as insufficient myopia. Again, we had them sort of self-report that their refractive error was 0.75 diopters more or more myopic. But when 17% of these patients got into our clinic, 
we refracted them and found that they were essentially Plano. Um, they needed no power. They were emetropic, yet they were wearing lenses that were minus one, minus 1 1.5 in one patient of um, myopia correction. That could definitely cause some discomfort, right? If you're that overcorrected. And then about 5% disqualified for other reasons that aren't really relevant to this conversation. So this was really compelling to me. I mean, we were already as, as a research group kind of on this path of evaluating contact lens discomfort and how vision influences it. But this group that sort of didn't qualify for the study we were doing really was compelling to me because it showed that, you know, in a group of subjectively and objectively uncomfortable contact lens wearers, a lot of them have visual issues that are not being addressed at all. So as we move forward talking today, I'm going to talk about those four things that we found in that study, the, the sort of four groups of patients with visual issues that were not being addressed. Um, un, unacknowledged binocular vision and accommodative issues, overcorrected myopia, uncorrected astigmatism. And then finally, we'll finish by talking about emerging and early presbyopia, which is what that study was looking at to begin with. Um, so hopefully by talking about these four things, this will help you as you're uh, encountering uncomfortable contact lens wearers in clinic in the coming weeks. Okay, so let's talk about binocular vision and accommodative disorders first. Um, so we oftentimes think about BV and accommodative issues in pediatric populations, right? Like that's when we really try to isolate and identify BV and accommodative issues. But it's important to note that about a third of all adults have a binocular vision or accommodative disorder. That's a pretty big number if you step back and think about it. I don't claim to be a, a binocular vision or pediatric specialist by any means, but when I see that number, it makes me sit back and sort of ask myself, like, when was the last time I performed like a full sensory motor or binocular vision evaluation on an adult uncomfortable contact lens wear? It, it's not that common, right? When our patients complain of discomfort, we're not pulling out our cover paddle and our um, you know, prism bar. That's not super common, but maybe it should be. Interestingly, patients who report contact lens discomfort actually have very similar symptom patterns to patients who have binocular vision and accommodative disorders. Both groups of patients report things like eye strain, fatigue, blurry, changeable vision. And notably, both groups have symptom patterns that become more intense and frequent at the end of the day, as we discussed earlier, is something we see in uncomfortable contact lens wearers. Um, interestingly, symptoms associated with uh, dry eye and contact lens discomfort are highly correlated with symptoms associated with um, binocular vision disorders. So we did a study where we had recruited a group of uh, patients with dry eye for a sort of a different um, study cause, and we gave them the CISS, which is the Convergence Insufficiency Symptom Survey, which measures symptoms of um, convergence insufficiency, the most arguably the most common type of binocular vision disorder, and the OSDI, which is a common dry eye survey. And you can see that the survey scores are highly correlated. In fact, when you look at the symptoms or the questions that these two surveys ask, some of the questions are nearly identical. They ask about things like, you know, eye strain or discomfort when looking up close or with prolonged near work. So it's not super surprising, but it's something that we need to acknowledge because again, when we consider binocular vision issues, we almost never think about the ocular surface, right? I, the, at the two institutions I've worked at, um, the contact lens clinic and the binocular vision clinics were either on different floors or in different buildings completely. And I think that's a good sort of analogy or metaphor for sort of how we house those two things in our brain. And maybe we need to bring those two together and consider how they're influencing one another. Um, we actually recruited a group of, um, you know, uh, adult 20 something uncomfortable soft contact lens wearers and basically worked them up for to see if they had signs of dry eye or signs of binocular vision disorders. So in this group of uh, uh uncomfortable contact lens wearers, we found that the prevalence of dry eye and BV issues was about the same, actually. So about 50% of them had um, significant signs of dry eye and or a binocular vision disorder. Convergence insufficiency was um, by far and away the, the most common um, binocular vision disorders that we saw in these patients. And additionally, we found that, oops, I got ahead of myself there. 
regardless of if a patient had enough signs to sort of qualify them for a d- diagnosis of a binocular vision disorder, high accommodative lag was a really common visual or binocular vision sign in 50, about 50% of the patients here. So about half of the participants had accommodative lag of a diopter or more, which was interesting to me because you have to imagine if your accommodative lag is that high, when you're wearing contact lenses, that has to be uncomfortable and causing some eye strain. So it's not just a coincidence that patients who are experiencing contact lens discomfort may be experiencing discomfort associated with a BV or accommodative issue that they only experience when they're wearing contact lenses, not when they're wearing glasses. And we just have to go back to our sort of foundational optics courses and and, kind of rewind and remember all those optics we learned in school um, to really understand that. So it's a really simple concept. We know that patients who are myopic have to converge and accommodate more when they're wearing contact lenses versus when they're wearing spectacle lenses. Um, Myopic spectacle lenses create a base in effect when we're looking up close. And so a myope, when they're wearing glasses, just has to converge less than when they're wearing their contact lenses because the contact lenses don't have that base in effect. Additionally, just the difference between having the correction in a spectacle lens in front of your face versus having it in a contact lens on the cornea um, causes a sort of effectivity change that's going to Uh, require the eye to accommodate more when corrected with contact lenses. We know the opposite sort of phenomenon is seen in hyperopes, but it's, I think it's safe to say that the majority of our contact lens wearers are myopic. And so again, the hypothesis here is that our myopic patients who um, are wearing contact lenses might experience convergence and accommodative demands with contact lenses that are sort of too much for their binocular vision or accommodative system to comfortably manage. And so they might interpret um, improved comfort with spectacle lens wear um, just because they don't have to converge and and accommodate as much with those spectacle lenses. So I've explained to you why this might be a cause of why binocular vision and accommodative issues might be a cause of discomfort in your contact lens wear, but how can you, take that information and use it clinically to better identify these patients. Again, I'm not claiming to be a binocular vision expert by any means, um, but really it just comes down to acknowledging that a binocular vision issue could be a cause and making sure that you're you're, uh, doing some easy clinical tests to identify that. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You really just need to get your cover paddle out, right? check cover test at distance and check cover test at near. If your patient is, you know, has a a higher exophoria at near than distance with their contact lenses, that could certainly be contributing to their sense of comfort. Um, Doing other tests like um, near point of convergence and accommodative amplitude or facility can also help you identify these patients who might be experiencing symptoms associated with binocular vision and accommodative issues. And by identifying that, you can then, you know, get your patient to, um, Um, to a better place, maybe get them to a colleague who can help with vision therapy um, or consider maybe working with the power of the lenses to help reduce sort of accommodative strain. Um, So it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You just need to open your mind to make sure that you're considering this as an option for discomfort causes. Also, it's important when we're considering binocular vision and accommodative issues to consider how signs and symptoms might change throughout the day. Um, with heavy near work or computer use. So if your patient's complaining of discomfort and you're seeing them at eight in the morning, your cover test, your NPC, your accommodative accommodative facility may come out completely normal because they haven't been, you know, looking at their computer or their phone all day. You might want to see these patients later in the day or after work or, you know, at four o'clock instead of eight o'clock in the morning um, to see if their symptoms change or become more, um, the magnitude of, you know, accommodative lag or exophoria near increases as they fatigue throughout the day. Okay, the next cause of visual discomfort in our contact lens wearers, this one, there's not a lot of evidence sort of backing this, but um, it's something I want to acknowledge and make sure we're thinking about, and that is overcorrected myopia. Again, when I did that study I mentioned earlier, I was really struck by how many patients came in 
you know, overcorrected by a diopter or more, right? They're just walking around with a diopter of myopic correction that they don't need. Um, because myopes need to accommodate more with contact lens correction, unnecessary contact lens um, or unnecessary myopic correction can lead to accommodative strain with contact lenses, but not spectacles. So even if your myope is optimally corrected with their contact lenses, they are already going to have to accommodate more with contacts than they would with glasses. So don't give them extra myopic correction to make that worse. Um, so if you're suspecting that your patient could be a little over minus or having some overcorrected myopia, easy to find that out, right? Trial small amounts of plus power in your over refraction. Um, consider a, a cycloplegic or just a damp refraction with just trapicamide. I actually had this happen yesterday with a patient I saw in the clinic. She was a um, in her mid twenties, a moderate myope, and was just running my student around on in the foreopter um, with her refraction. And I looked back at her chart, and she definitely had a history of doing this in the past. And I we just assumed that she had a pretty robust accommodative system that was sort of you know flexing and relaxing, flexing and relaxing during that refraction. So we waited until she was dilated to refract her again, and that really helped us pull out her true prescription. And um, ultimately we ended up prescribing about a half to 0.75 diopters less myopia correction than what my student had measured um, in, in the dry refraction. So don't underestimate the importance of checking a damp, you know, a wet or just a damp refraction in our adult patients um, if they're reporting some discomfort. Again, just like with virgins and accommodative issues, consider how symptoms and signs change as the day progresses as well with this type of uh, concern. Okay, the next visual issue that could be contributing to your contact lens wearer's discomfort is uncorrected astigmatism. This is a big one, a really, really, really big one that we do not consider enough. About half of all of our soft contact lens wearers have 0.75 diopters or more of astigmatism in at least one eye. However, only about a quarter of our um, soft contact lens wearers are fitted in a toric contact lens. So that means about half of patients that probably should be wearing a toric contact lens wearer or a, a toric contact lens are not wearing a toric contact lens. Um, if we corrected all of the astigmatism that should be corrected in our Contact, soft contact lens wearers, about 50% more of them would be wearing a toric lens. So why is this, right? We have a lot of toric options available to us. Why aren't we prescribing toric lenses for all of our patients that have toricity in their prescription? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons why we're not doing that, right? Um, you know, toric lenses in 2023 are very different than toric lenses in the year 2003, right? Um, you know, in the last couple of decades, the technology associated with toric soft contact lenses has improved dramatically. Most toric lenses stabilize on most people now. We don't see crazy high amounts of rotation anymore. And um, our options for, you know, monthly, biweekly, daily disposables, parameter, um, availability has really expanded so that most patients can have a uh, a good soft torque option for their vision correction. But some of our preconceptions about what torque lenses can and can't do from decades past are probably influencing our habits in prescribing them now. So there's probably some leftover preconceptions that Fitting a toric lens takes more chair time, that it's a little bit more difficult than fitting a spherical lens, that it's not that important for patients who have low amounts of astigmatism. You know, in the past, there might have been spherical lenses that touted, you know, that they could, quote unquote, mask small amounts of astigmatism, which I tend to disagree with. Um, all of these things that might be sort of holdouts from previous you know, previous years of practice really aren't true anymore in 2023. I'm going to kind of show you some evidence to support that next. So there's really no difference in chair time associated with fitting a soft spherical contact lens compared to a soft toric contact lens. So while that may have, may have been true 20 years ago, with modern soft toric lenses, there's actually good evidence to show that 
it takes the same amount of time to fit a soft spherical lens as it does a soft toric lens. And most importantly, patients prefer the toric lens over the spherical lens, even if they have small amounts of astigmatism. We've talked already several times, and we will continue to talk in this lecture about how important subjective patient preference and just sort of patient opinion is when we're fitting contact lenses. Your patient's opinion is really important. If they don't like something, they're not going to wear it and they'll ultimately discontinue. So we need to be considering subjectively what our patients prefer. And there's been several really good studies in the last couple of years that have shown that even um, with low amounts of astigmatism, patients prefer wearing the toric lens compared to the spherical lens. Um, let me, I, I just lost my train of thought there. Forgive me. Again, it's, it's really early here. So that's, I'm, I'm feel like I'm doing okay so far. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, there's been several studies that have shown, I already mentioned low asigmats, but also moderate asigmats have improved visual acuity. Um, and again, just overall subjective visual experience with toric lenses. Um, but also, it's important to remember that astigmatic lenses are going to improve the overall visual quality that our patients experience. So even for low astigmats, full astigmatic correction is going to improve overall visual function um, in low light and glare conditions. So things like contrast sensitivity um, and just general ability to function in low light and high glare situations has been shown to be better when all astigmatism is corrected with, corrected with contact lenses, even in your low astigmats. So this is a really important to keep in mind because I think it's easy, um, you know, in the midst of a busy clinic day, if a patient, um, you know, has 0.75 diopters of astigmatism and they're quote unquote fine with their spherical lenses to just keep, you know, kicking the can down the road and prescribing that spherical lens. But I like to really um, look at fresh manifest refraction data each year and consider if my patient could benefit from upgrading to a toric lens. So when I start to see the spectacle prescription show 0.75 diopters or more of astigmatism, I'm reaching for that toric lens. We wouldn't, you know, when we're prescribing a pair of glasses, I wouldn't leave the astigmatism in the foropter and ignore it, right? So if I measure 0.75 diopters of astigmatism in the foropter, that's what I would prescribe in my glasses prescription. And we should do that with our contact lenses too. We have the ability to do that now. There are, um, again, uh, replacement schedules and parameter availability for, for basically any regular astigmat um, in soft contact lenses. And so we should definitely be prescribing that. Um, interestingly, correcting full astigmatism could also improve our patient's overall comfort with their contact lenses. I really like the study by Stephanie Cox um, back in 2018, where they fitted um, patients with low astigmatism in toric contact lenses um, and basically asked the question, do you prefer the toric contact lens or do you prefer an analogous uh, spherical contact lens? And this study found that um, patients did tend to prefer the toric lens and they performed better um, with the toric lens. What I really liked about this study is that they also gave the patients the CISS. If you recall, the CISS is that Convergence Insufficiency Symptom Survey, that survey that measures symptoms associated with binocular vision issues. That survey might be our best survey for sort of indirectly measuring visual discomfort in our contact lens wearers. And this study found that CISS scores improved significantly with the toric lens compared to the spherical lens. So how I interpret that is that patients, when they were wearing the toric contact lens, had better visual comfort than when they were wearing the spherical lens, even if they had small amounts of astigmatism. So uncorrected astigmatism can definitely lead to visual discomfort. So when you're considering an uncomfortable contact lens where consider their astigmatic status. And if you are optimally correcting their um, astigmatic vision with the contact lens. Okay, the last visual phenomenon that we're gonna address today that could be influencing discomfort in your contact lens wearers is early and emerging presbyopia. Um, I like to talk a lot about multifocal contact lenses. I love fitting presbyopes in contact lenses and that's a talk for another day. But today I wanna to focus on our early and emerging presbyopes. You know, it's 
it's uh, easy to not even consider a uh, presbyopic vision correction, like a multifocal contact lens until our patients experience sustained near blur up close. But it's really important to remember that presbyopia doesn't happen overnight, right? Despite what our patients might kind of subjectively experience, we know that our accommodative amplitude decreases as we progress through life, right? It starts when we're born, but I, I want you to look at this graph here, which is showing how accommodative amplitude changes or, or basically declines as we age. And what's really compelling to me in this graph is that we see the steepest slope of decline in between age 30 and age 40. So can you see how it sort of, you know, kind of plateaued here in our teens and 20s? And then when we hit our late 20s, we start to just see accommodative amplitude just drop, right? So we don't usually start addressing presbyopia in our contact lens wearers until they're down here, right? In this area where the, you know, the amplitude has just, it's zero, right? But I think it's really important to acknowledge that in our 30s, our patients are going to be experiencing a rapid decline in their accommodative ability. Um, and while they're still going to be able to get to that clear near point, it's going to be harder for them to get there. And that could certainly be influencing their comfort when they're wearing contact lenses. Um, so this slide is basically just describing a lot of the things that I just said to you in words. Um, loss of accommodative amplitude is a gradual process. While our symptoms of near polar typically occur in the mid 40s, definitely patients could be experiencing symptoms associated with presbyopic accommodative decline in their mid to late 30s. It's also important to note that especially in these early and emerging presbyopes, they may feel like spectacle wear alleviates their um, symptoms of discomfort associated with emerging presbyopia because they can just peek under their glasses, right? A myope can just sort of peek under the glasses, or maybe they even subconsciously take the glasses off to help reduce that accommodative demand. And so they may not even realize that they're sort of habitually changing their habits to reduce their accommodative load. This study by um, Bill Reindel several years ago looked at causes of asthenopia or eye strain in a group of 30-somethings and found, not surprisingly, that the main cause of asthenopia or eye strain in these groups was ill-sustained accommodation. So whether you're wearing a contact lens or not, early and emerging presbyope can influence your um, visual comfort. And so we really need to think about this critically when we're thinking about contact lens wearers. So that study I mentioned to you at the beginning of the um, lecture is the one I'm going to finish by talking about today. So this is a study where we recruited a group of uncomfortable 30-somethings who were wearing contact lenses. And basically the question we asked was, does wearing a low-powered multifocal influence comfort in these patients? So this was a, a crossover clinical trial where um, the half the patients started with a, a single vision spherical soft contact lens and then for a couple of weeks, and then we're crossed over to where the multifocal for a couple of weeks, the other half started with the multifocal first. Um, and basically we had them wear the two different lenses, fill out um, comfort surveys um, after wearing each lens. And then at the end of the study, we asked them what lenses they preferred for different activities. So we found that younger wear, so patients who were between age 30 and 34 had better comfort with the, um, single vision contact lenses, but where is approaching presbyopia? So those in the 35 to 40 year age range actually had similar comfort, was statistically the same with the single vision and multifocal contact lens. So I think it's not surprising in a group of non-presbyopes, they find the single vis vision lens to be more comfortable or their general preference is for the single vision lens. But what's really interesting is that as they age and as they move through their 30s, there's not really a difference in comfort between the single vision and the multifocal lens. I should note here that both lenses used in this study were physically identical. They had the same base curve material diameter. The only difference between the lenses was optics. We also found that more emerging presbyopes preferred the multifocal for vision and comfort compared to the younger group. And I'll show you some of that data in a moment. Um, when we found these results showing that, um, that older age group tended to have similar single vision and multifocal contact lens scores. We 
went back into the data and asked basically if there were any uh, clinical characteristics or demographic characteristics that helped predict if a patient was going to have a better score with the single vision or the multifocal lens. We looked at things like refractive error, um, you know, demographic factors like gender, but the only thing we really found um, significant was age. So again, as, as I kind of noted in the slide pre previous, younger wearers tended to have better comfort with the single vision lens, while older wearers tended to have similar comfort with both the single vision and the multifocal lens. A main conclusion we made from the study was that our uncomfortable contact lens wearers might benefit from wearing a multifocal sooner in life than is typically practiced. Um, anecdotally, I'll tell you, in this particular study, um, we didn't give patients a prescription at the end of the study, but when we were finished, a lot of the study patients were interested in a prescription with the lenses. And I had um, several patients come back and see me you know, outside of the research lab and in clinic um, requesting prescriptions for the multifocal contact lens, which I found fascinating and also really encouraging and compelling. What might be most interesting from the study was the subjective patient responses. So again, I've been harping on how important patient preferences and how important our patients' like uh, subjective uh, opinions are. And so because of that, at the end of the study, besides taking all the surveys, we also just asked patients what lenses they preferred um, for different activities. So let's look at the younger group first. So they had the option of preferring their habitual lenses, the ones they came in wearing, the single vision or the multifocal lenses. And you'll see here that for those patients in the group younger than 35, they almost always preferred the single vision lens, right? It's pretty, um, this is all also every every group here is statistically significant. So whether it's for near intermediate distance or overall vision or comfort, this younger group preferred the single vision lens. When we ask the same question about preference to that older group, you'll see that the preferences are not as distinct, right? It's a little more unclear. In fact, there's no statistically significant preference in any of these groups for one lens over the other. So as we see these patients age, we see that they tend to prefer the multifocal more. So really interestingly, you know, over 40% of them preferred the multifocal for near vision. So these are not full presbyopes, right? But they're still saying, oh, it's easier to see up close with these lenses. Overall, about 30% of these emerging presbyopes preferred the multifocal for different parts of vision or for overall vision or com comfort. And so what this says to me is that 30% of our emerging presbyopes could benefit from a multifocal earlier in life than waiting until they're 45 or 48 to fit a multifocal. What this is telling me is that early and emerging presbyopia is influencing their visual comfort in contact lens wear. Again, patient preference is so important. And so those tables I just showed you or those graphs I just showed you, I think are pretty compelling to show that you know, we need to be asking patients what they prefer. Um, so, it, you know, identifying these uncomfortable emerging presbyopes is easy, right? You got to look at their date of birth, look at their age and say, are they uncomfortable? Can I address some of their um, visual discomfort with a low powered multifocal? Um, I found that the best way to have success with these patients is to just um, be really open about communication and education about how they will adapt to a multifocal, what they might experience during that adaptation period. And why you're introducing this lens and what benefit you think it might bring to them. All right, so that is going to cover the those main visual factors that um, I know are contributing to our patient's contact lens discomfort. So I hope acknowledging those sort of four different groups of visual causes will help you better think and manage contact lens discomfort in your patients. Um, if you have more interest in this topic, I actually published a paper this year um, reviewing visual discomfort and contact lens wear. I talk about some of the things we talked about here, but also do an even deeper dive into the literature, um, looking at um, other evidence that supports this idea of visual discomfort and contact lens wear. So that was published in Contact Lens and Interior Eye um, earlier this year. So I encourage you um, to read that if or to um reference that if you have other thoughts or questions. And um, by all means, um, feel free to email me or um, post any questions right now, or feel free to um, ask me any questions you have. But again, thank you very much for letting me um, drop in and talk to you today.
Thank you so much, uh, Taryn, for that wonderful, I think, comprehensive talk. I think you did pick up the most four important ones, uh, I guess, which we miss and which can be easily handled, if I may put it that way. It's really uh, something if we keep in mind, I think we can get very little dropouts because of discomfort, right? Yeah, yeah. I agree. <laughs> awesome. Great. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, thank you for sharing that paper as well. Uh, I have had a read on it and it's really wonderful to kind of go through uh, tons of evidence you have put in together in this review, uh, mm -hmm. which tells us about what's what has happened a couple of decades back and how is that changed now and yeah. the way future as well. I guess some part of it in how to take care to make sure the future is good as practitioners and for our contact lens weather. So thank you so much for, you know, sharing that details of the paper as well. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, great. This was fun. Thank you so much for having me. Most welcome. Okay, there was one question uh, which came in. I think this was during the uh, time where you were talking about fitting astigmatics. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody wanted to know, have you found a difference in fitting the low astigmats with a silicon hydrogel material spherical lenses versus a hydrogel material spherical lenses? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, and I think what, I, again, I think what you're referring to is probably, there's definitely been some sci highs come out in the last several years that um, maybe say that they can mask some astigmatism. Yeah, the masking of the low astigmatism, yeah. Yeah, because they have a higher, obviously a sci high has a higher modulus, um, I mean, I don't have any data to support that, but I, I have, I, I don't think that's probably the best option. I think we should, instead of masking the astigmatism, why don't we just correct it? You know, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, and, and with the options yeah. available, why don't we do that? Right. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I, there actually, there's a, a recent lens that came out where my, um, like the the manufacturer's representative was saying, oh, it's a it's a sphere and it has some aspheric optics that can mask um, some astigmatism. And I I kind of thought the same thing. Like, okay, that's nice, but instead of masking it, why don't we just correct it? You know what I mean? Like, why try to mask it with something that's not actually going to fix it? <laughs> that's right. And we yeah. have options. It's one thing to try to mask it when there were, you know, there was a time when there weren't great options for those patients, but now there is, so we shouldn't mask it. We should just correct it. Correct, yeah. And I think one other question, I think, which came in during the multifocal section was, you know, using these newer extended depth of focus designs mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to uh, something like the spectacle lenses, they have this relaxing lens where you have a little bit of plus and there are certain contact lenses i guess available any experience yeah. on that in terms of the early emerging press biops any experience? yeah that's a really great question yeah i wouldn't choose so if you're gonna put if you're considering fitting a, a multifocal on a emerging press biop i wouldn't choose one of those extended depth of focus lenses because um well, first of all, those lenses only come in one ad power. And the, the whole point is to allow like a deep, like a, a up to a high ad. And so that would probably not be the best lens to start with, with those patients. I would choose a lens brand that has sort of your more traditional, like low, high or low, medium, high and start we're basically presuming, like use the fitting guide as if that patient has the lowest ad possible. Um, so, so that's what I would stick with. Sorry, you asked, what was the other part of your question? You asked about extended depth of focus and- Yeah, and these relaxing lenses, you know. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so Cooper Vision, um, and forgive me if you might have other products available to you that maybe I'm not aware of. Um, in, in the States here, they have a, it's called Biofinity Energis and then a, a Vera Vitality, which they kind of market, and no disclosures make. So I'm just telling you sort of how I interpret what they- um have said they sort of market it as a uh yeah kind of like a digital eye stream lens sort of yeah. um and from what i can interpret it just has like the smallest of small like multifocal ad in it basically of like asphericity um personally for me clinically i found that when i feel like i need to reach for a multifocal i'm not reaching for that that lens i'm just going for a multifocal kind of like if i'm doing it let's do it so um but that said i would 
you know, maybe with your younger patients, like a 20 something, you might consider one of those sort of relaxing lenses first. That's right. Yeah. Because I think now uh, it's becoming very famous, like the spectacle lenses where you have these relaxed lenses. Yes. Yep. I, yeah. I, I believe they are more for digital eye strain kind of thing, maybe, but not to, I don't know, it kind yeah. of overlaps, but then, yeah, it, it's a bit of uh, something. Yeah. yeah. And I always think of those, like, I would ultimately, like, I'm, try to not have my contact lens wearers also have to wear a pair of glasses over top if we can help it. You know what I mean? Like, so I try to uh, address those visual needs with the contact lens when I can, before we consider maybe adding a spectacle lens on top. Great. And I'm just taking one question, which is popped up. Any thoughts or experiences which you found uh, from patients who were having toricity, I mean, let's say astigmatism, when you mm -hmm. change to change them to a multifocal optics. So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, because, the, you know, until recently, we didn't really have great toric multifocal options. Um, here in the States now we have two. So we have the biofinity toric multifocal and the ultra um, toric multifocal. So biofinity is made by Cooper Vision. Um, the ultra is made by Bausch and Lomb. Um, so those are two really great options that I've been utilizing now when I want to take my single vision toric wear and put them in a multifocal. I'd say the only downside of that is those are monthly replacement lenses. So, you know, if you've got a daily disposable wear, that is a, something to consider. Um, I try to, I try to practice what I preach and not take my toric wear and then put them in a spherical multifocal if I can help it. Um, but you kind of have to deal with that on a case by case basis based on the parameters that are available to you. Um, this might sound like a stretch too, but I am not opposed to putting a toric lens wearer and a GP multifocal either. If, if I feel like that is what's going to help them, um, you know, I'm a big cheerleader for GP multifocals. They have the best optics. Um, and you know, if you can get your patient in that mindset, that can be a really successful endeavor if they're astigmatic. Awesome. Great. So I think thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aaron, for uh, spending an early Sunday morning with us and yeah. sharing uh, the insights of uh, what you have been researching for the past couple of years and uh, really giving us uh, some very important clinical tips, which we can bring into clinic. I think the next moment we step in there. So thank you so much uh, for spending a Sunday morning with us. Of course. Thank you for having me. And like I said, feel free to shoot me an email or if you see me at a meeting, say hi. Um, I love meeting new people. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We do have session planned over the next weekend. We, until then, take care, be safe and hope to see you during the next session. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. You.